according to the American Heritage Dictionary, English Language 5th Edition. Obviously one of these uh, continuously uh, living documents, which is uh, used in the term of constantly revised. <laughs> Uh, states that it's a choice and use of words in speech or writing, degree of clarity and distinctness, pronunciation in speech or seeing, enunciation, expression of ideas by words, manner of saying, choice or selection of words, style. So that would be written or spoken. Diction, according to Wikipedia, in its original meaning is a writer's or speaker's distinctive vocabulary, choices and style of expression in a poem or story. In its common meaning, it is the distinctiveness of speech, the art of speaking, so that each word is clearly heard and understood to its fullest complexity and extremity and concerns pronunciation and tone, rather than word choice and style. In Spanish, horror, <clears throat> which if it would be French would be jure, where we get our word jury, is to swear. <clears throat> now, with those two previous definitions, we understand to the full extent in which the word jurisdiction has been manipulated. Where it states, according to the American Heritage Dictionary, the same one that wrote the one about diction, states jurisdiction, the right of a court to hear a particular case based on the scope of its authority over the type of case and the parties to the case. Authority of control, extent of authority or control. So jurisdiction has nothing to do with authority except for the word author being the individuals authoring it. So where this definition of jurisdiction states that it's uh, the right of a court, it's actually the stated under oath uh it's just a statement under oath, basically. Being diction and juris, being swearing. Jurisdiction, according to Wikipedia, is a legal term for the legal authority granted to a legal entity to enact justice in federations like the United States. The concept of jurisdiction applies at multiple levels. Jurisdiction draws its substance from international conflict of laws, constitutional law, and the powers the executive and legislative branches of the government to allocate resources to best serve the needs of society. Of course, naturally, it has absolutely nothing to do with any of that. It, this is all just a manipulation of the word jurisdiction, which simply means a sworn statement. Basically, either verbal or uh, written. So what is not the republic, or the constitutional republic anyway? What is not the constitutional republican form of uh, law? To get an idea of what it's not, we can look at the American Legal Publishing Codes Library, which basically has all of the codes, property of the International Pro Code Council, of course, uh, for every state and, uh, well, every municipal corporation within all of the state corporation. So here, we'll just pick one. Uh, we'll go with Arizona, and we'll go ahead and look at the municipal codes for the city of Carefree, Arizona. Rather interesting name. <laughs> Property Tax Proposals, Section 15-11. An affirmative vote of two-thirds of the members of the Carefree Common Council is required to present any property tax proposal to the registered voters of the town. Property tax or increase. The majority vote of the registered voters of the town of Carefree voting on issues required before any Carefree Town property tax or increase the existing Carefree Town property tax previously approved by the Carefree voters shall be enacted. That is a direct violation of the of well, multiple sections of the Constitution, but specifically the direct taxation of well, direct capitation or taxation not enumerated in the Constitution. The Constitution only enumerates one form of taxation, and it is supposed to be uniform across all uh, places, pretty much. This is a violation of that because it is, in fact, a direct tax that is not enumerated in the Constitution. Adoption of tax code, right? Code. 
a tax code. The certain code entitled the Town Privilege and Excise Tax Code of the Town of Carefree adopted by ordinance, blah, blah, blah. Um, and here ratified and made a part of this code the same as is if specifically reenacted hereby. At least three copies of said code and amendment shall be kept and filed in the office of the town clerk. A certain document known as Town of Carefree Use Tax, three copies of which are filed in the office of the town clerk. And of course, these are all just more direct capitations and taxes not enumerated in the Constitution. And of course, it goes on further. The powers and duties set forth and conferred upon it under the provisions of the state constitution and statutes, this code, and all ordinances and resolutions of the town. This has to do with the powers and duties of town judge. Keeping of a docket in which shall be entered each action and proceedings of the court therein. Responsibility for setting and receiving all bonds and bails, receiving all fines, penalties, fees, forfeitures, and all monies as provided by law. That, of course, is not the constitutional law. That is their law, the codes. Payment of all, of all fees, fines, penalties, forfeitures, and money is collected by the court to the treasurer. Payment of all surcharges levied thereon by the state to the state treasurer as required by law. So these municipal corporations, they support the state corporation by uh, essentially seizing and taking all of this stuff, and then it goes into the state treasurer or state treasury. Issuance of execution against the property of any defendant failing to pay any fine imposed for violation of this code or of a town ordinance. Such execution shall be favor of the town and shall be issued and enforced like executions and civil actions. Now, isn't that interesting? So if you refuse to pay their unlawful direct capitations and taxes in violation of the U.S. Constitution, then they will seize your property on behalf of themselves. So now we're going to go and look at a different place called Grandview Heights, which is a area inside of that extremely corrupt uh, Columbus, Ohio area region, which is uh, more than just a single municipal section. But in fact, it's a conglomeration of many different municipal corporations, all forming the so-called city of Columbus in Ohio. Recovery of incarceration costs. Pursuant to the sections of the Ohio Revised Code, there you go again with that word code, that are recited in the preamble hereto, which are incorporated, incorporated, right? Like a corporation, incorporated. By reference, the legislative authority of the municipal corporation, the city of Grandview Heights, Ohio, does hereby require any person who is convicted of any offense, of an offense, other than minor misdemeanor and is sentenced to confinement in the county jail to reimburse the city for its ex expenses incurred by reason of the offender's confinement, including but not limited to the expenses relating to the provision of food, clothing, and shelter. Such reimbursements shall include expenses for pre-conviction confinement when credit for such confinement is credited against the term of imprisonment. So that is guilty. Uh, well, the word guilt is not really something used in uh, in the Constitution. That would be consistent with the unreasonable search and seizures. Well, not, incons not consistent. That would be inconsistent. So it would be a violation of the unreasonable search and seizure portion of the U.S. Constitution among many others and many other parts of the Constitution. And then down on D, we find that funds are reimbursed to the city pursuant to this section shall be paid in the general fund of the city treasury. So here we have a city treasury, which I guarantee has uh, a long uh, uh, cooperation or, or something with the state treasury because these corporations, they are all hierarchical. So these municipal corporations, they prop up or support the state corporation, which essentially is a occupying force and they are carrying out their law of codes, property of the International Code Council from Switzerland. Now we look at the concealed carry weapons section. This is, remember, the codes for the municipality, the municipal corporation of Grandview Heights, Ohio. Uh, it's in Class D liquor permit premises unless the person possesses a killed concealed permit is not consuming alcohol. 
in a vehicle unless a person possesses a concealed carry permit this is where they're saying you can't carry firearms in or on any private buildings where the owner or operator of such private buildings has posted a sign in clear view or has provided verbal notice of such prohibition provided however that firearms may be maintained in locked compartments of park persons via personal vehicles in the manner authorized by state law that's the state corporate corporate law essentially uh, like a corporate policy right all of these are obviously violation of the second amendment in private daycare centers where no gun signs are posted in school building or school premises in or on any public or private college university or other institutions of higher education unless the board of trustees or other governing body of such institution has adopted a written policy or rule authorizing individuals to carry concealed handgun on school premises now isn't that interesting this municipal corporate code is elevating the university or quote other institutions of higher education their board of trustees and or other governing body as the law makers on who can and cannot carry firearms no person shall do any of the following if the person is stopped for a law enforcement purpose failed to properly inform any law enforcement officer who approaches the person after the person has been stopped that the person is carrying a handgun or other weapon other weapon there there are a slew of other weapons that could be construed from this category if the person is stopped for a law enforcement purpose knowingly failed to keep the person's hands in plain sight at any time after any law enforcement officer begins approaching the person while stopped and before the law enforcement officer leaves unless the failure is pursuant to in accordance with directions given by a local law enforcement officer those are of course violations of the um uh, life liberty and property without due process deprivation of life liberty and property without due process that would be the deprivation of liberty obviously if that law enforcement so-called law enforcement officer decides to enact force then they will uh, be in violation of the deprivation of life and uh naturally it is not just the law enforcement officers that would uh require adjudication for these things but specifically the individuals that are imposing these codes on us if the person is stopped for a law enforcement purpose knowingly disregard or fail to comply with any lawful order of any law enforcement officer given while the person is stopped that is the lawful uh, as in the code not as in the constitution including but not limited to a specific order to the person to keep the person's hands in plain sight and uh, so on and so forth uh, this section does not apply to any of the following an officer agent or employee or this or any other state or the United States to a law enforcement officer who is authorized to carry concealed weapons or dangerous ordinance or is authorized to carry handguns and is acting within the scope of the officer's agents or employees duties so basically this section apply applies completely and only to all of us that are not agents of their corporate dominance so that is deprivation of rights constitutional rights under the color of law now here's the mission statement the city of grandview heights board of health has its mission the promotion regulation and procedural procurement of the public safety and health it is our belief that all citizens within our jurisdiction again using that word incorrectly as in a, a sworn statement regardless of economic mental or, or logistical abilities are entitled to competent health services three monitoring and controlling environmental factors that could have an impact on the quality of health for our citizens our citizens is stated here as property or as cattle or livestock right it, they are monitoring any threat that could um, infringe on the quote health of their livestock basically that's the idea there if you were a rancher cattle rancher and you had a, a cattle well your duty would be to go around and ensure that nothing can damage that steal it or otherwise uh, harm it of course we are not cattle but that's the way they see us that is the context of that number three it's incredibly insidious and highly uh, contrary to the Constitution so here we're going to look at another example a different one this is the immigration court practice manual here they have everything stipulated about how paperwork or filings with this court 
are allowed to be done. It's entirely arbitrary and in many cases uh, would be a violation of different parts of the Constitution. But there are such horrible micromanagers that they will stipulate to the paper size and document quality, tabs, pagination, table of contents, and consolidated cases. Essentially, uh, the court head doesn't have to do that much work because they have all of this stipulated in their little procedural manual and naturally if you don't do what the procedure manual says then your uh, paperwork will be denied we also have cover page and caption format fonts and spacing binding and forms this just stuff is ridiculous. The Immigration Court and the Board of Immigration Appeals uses a two-hole punch system to maintain paper files. All forms, motions, briefs, and other submissions should always be pre-punched with holes along the top, centered and two and three quarter, uh, two inches and three quarters apart. Submissions may be stapled in the top left corner if stapling is impracticable. The use of removable binder clips is encouraged. Submissions should neither be bound on the side nor commercially bound, as such items may be disassembled to fit into the record of proceedings and might be damaged in the process. Use of ACO-type fasteners and paper clips is discouraged. So that is uh, quite ridiculous. The level of of domination. Uh, that these people enact. Now here we get the area where we understand that it will be denied if you don't follow their ridiculous and arbitrary regulations to the quote-unquote letter. Defective filings. Filings may be de deemed defective due to improper filing, untimely filing, or both. Improper filings. If an application, motion, brief, exhibit, or other submission is not properly filed, it is rejected by the immigration court with an explanation for the rejection. Well, there you go. Parties are expected to exercise due diligence. Parties wishing to correct the def defect and refile after rejection must do so promptly. See Chapter 3.1b. Timing of submissions must be timely. Also, subsections 2 below, the term rejected means that the filing is returned to the filing party because it is defective and therefore will not be considered by the immigration judge. It is an adjudication of the filing or a decision regarding its content. If a fee is required, failure to submit a fee receipt or fee waiver request. Failure to include a proof of service upon the opposing party. Failure to comply with the language, signature, and format requirements. Illegibility of the filing. If a document is improperly filed but not rejected, the immigration judge retains the authority to take appropriate action. That's, of course, left very vague. All of these are clearly uh, overt violations of the U.S. Constitution. And then, of course, we also have a section on untimely filings which all would be, uh, you know, part of their uh, procedural manual, which is not law, even though they enforce it like it is. All of that is uh, grounds for rejection by this fraudulent corporate corporation court. So here we get uh, an idea, uh, some history, if you will. Uh, the specific one that's important is the relationship to the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security was created in 2003 and assumed most of the functions of the former Immigration and Naturalization Service. DHS is responsible for enforcing immigration laws and administering immigration and naturalization benefits. Those, of course, are the unlawful, uh, anti-constitutional foreign laws that are imposed on us as part of the system of investment by foreign entities. By contrast, the immigration courts and the Board of Immigration Appeals are responsible for independently adjudicating cases under the immigration laws. Thus, DHS is entirely separate from the Department of Justice and the Executive Office for Immigration Review. In proceedings before the immigration court or the board, DHS is deemed to be a party and is represented by its component, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE. See Chapter 1.4a, Jurisdiction, again, you misusing that word. Immigration Judge Decisions, Department of Homeland Security. Relationship to the Immigration and Naturalization, Cer Naturalization Service. Prior to the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, INS, was responsible for enforcing immigration laws and administering immigration and naturalization benefits. Those are, of course, unlawful laws imposed on us contrary to the Constitution. INS was a component of the Department of Justice. INS has been abolished and its role has been assumed by DHS 
which is entirely separate from the Department of Justice. This is yet another example of what they always do, where they simply shift names and move things around, but they're all essentially the same things. They're all components of the same system, and they all do these things in the face of the actual law. And it makes all of the individuals involved in this corrupt corporation enemy combatants and also conspirators in a uh, an organization of overt foreign dominance. Now, here in a different part, we look at, uh, well, all of these things essentially are complete and they're completely contrary to the U.S. Constitution in every way that you could possibly be. They're also wicked and evil, but <clears throat> this section, Board of Immigration Appeals, or actually, no, uh, hold on, C, Immigration Judge Decisions. This is, it, it, you could not at all argue that this section is in any way adhering to the Constitution. Immigration judges render oral and written decisions at the end of immigration court proceedings. See, see chapter 4.16, decision. A decision of an immigration judge is final unless a party timely appeals the decision to the Board of Immigration Appeals or the case is certified to the board. Parties should note that the certification of a case is separate from any appeal in the case. That wording uh, it doesn't actually correlate with the Constitution. There is a section in the Constitution stating that all decisions by juries are final and cannot be retried. This here is telling you that the judge himself is essentially a God and King of this area. He can do whatever he wants and it doesn't matter what the law is. And in this little corrupt system of theirs, you just have to go to a, another a corporate shill representative of this corporate dominant system <clears throat> and you'll eventually you'll never ever actually get law enforcement from these people true law enforcement from the constitutional uh, republic they are enforcing unlawful laws and uh, they are adversaries here we get an explanation of where the revenue for this court comes from because this court is a subsidiary corporation they need revenue to operate and they get their revenue from direct capitations or taxes also called filing fees where paid fees for the filing of motions and applications for relief with the immigration court when required are paid to the department of homeland security now isn't that interesting the immigration court does not collect fees so when you're filing paperwork with this immigration court you are paying the department of homeland security your essentially according to the court opposition a party involved that represents blah 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 so who runs the immigration court department of homeland security does and there is absolutely no way in this little maze of nonsense to get justice filing fees for motions when required the following motions require a filing fee a motion to reopen accept a motion that is based exclusively on a claim for asylum a motion to reconsider except a motion that is based on an underlying claim for asylum for purposes of determining filing fee requirements the term asylum here includes withholding of removal restriction on removal withholding of deportation and claims under the convention against torture and other cruel inhumane or decreed treatment or punishment so basically if you don't pay them then they will enact cruel inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment and they will also do all of this other nasty stuff to you that if you don't want it to have done to you then you have to pay the piper as it were which is, of course, the Department of Homeland Security. Now, here is the most evil, wicked, and detestable portion of this procedural document. This is how they blatantly, openly, and in broad daylight, in the face of every law that we have in the Constitution, of, in the face of, of all the citizens that claim to be uh, Americans or claim to be in support of the Constitution or any of that stuff, this is how they openly engage in child trafficking. Detained juveniles, A, in general. There are special procedures for juveniles in federal custody, whether they're accompanied or unaccompanied. See, General 8 CFR. That uh, CFR, by the way, means uh, it's like, uh, codified federal registry or something like that they're codes they're more codes 
For purposes of this chapter, a juvenile is defined as a non-citizen under 18 years of age. An unaccompanied ju juvenile is defined as a non-citizen under 18 years of age who does not have parent or legal guardian in the United States to provide care and physical custody. Place and conditions of detention. The Department of Homeland Security, DHS, bears the initial responsibility for apprehension and detention of juveniles. Notice that it doesn't state non-citizen juveniles. It just states juveniles. When DHS determines that a juvenile is unaccompanied by a parent or legal guardian, DHS retains responsibility for the juvenile's detention and removal. When DHS determines that a juvenile is unaccompanied and must be detained, they are transferred to the care of the Department of Health and Human Services. Yeah, those wicked people. Child trafficking, right? Offices of Reg Refugee Resettlement, which provides for the care and placement where possible of the unaccompanied juvenile. Where possible. They will, of course, ensure that where possible means wherever they want. Representation, well, wherever they want, as far as profit can be gained from the sale of human flesh of children. Representation and conduct of hearing for provisions regarding the representation of juveniles and the conduct of hearings involving juveniles. Release unaccompanied juveniles who are released from custody are released to a parent, legal guardian, or an adult relative who is not in the Department of Homeland Security detention or in limited circumstances to an adult who is not a family member. There you go. That is that explains exactly how they get away with broad daylight child trafficking and some of the most detestable and wicked operations. And they they are criminal, but these people are are a higher level of wicked. So the main section of the Constitution, apart from all the blatant violations, is who is supposed to enforce the supreme law of the land. And we find that in the section stipulating to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the nation, suppress insurrections and repel invasions. That is the reason why we have no law and order in the, we have no republic right now because there is no militia executing the laws of the union. The militia is every armed person who has the force and will to execute the laws. That's why the militia has to be called forth to execute the laws against all of these corrupt, wicked criminals that run these municipal corporations, that run these fraudulent court systems that are all corporations too, all these little subsidiary codified enemies, right? You are either for the constitution or you're for the codes, but you cannot be for both. And if you're for the codes, then you rely on the fear of the people because they are the ones that are supposed to execute the laws of the union, according to the constitution. And repel invasions. We've been invaded. That hasn't been repelled. The insurrection has been going on since the 1860s and continues to go on today. And the laws are not being executed because it requires the militia, every armed person, every armed American national, every armed citizen, every person, according to the Constitution, that can enforce it to go out and do so by force, right? We, have, we are trained to be cowards in the school system. We are, tr are trained to fear these little petty dictators and all of their maze of nonsense. And we're trained to support our own foreign domination. That's the reason why we don't have a republic. So it doesn't matter uh, what documents they tamper with. It doesn't matter that they shift around things, that they play all these games and do all this stuff. There is the question of what did the, if we you can use that stupid term from the academics, the pre-colonials do to the individuals that did these sorts of things to them. Here we can find this in the book Trade and Empire, the British Customs Service in Colonial America, 1660 to 1775, Thomas E. Barrow, Harvard University Press, Cambridge, Cambridge Massachusetts, 1967. Copyright 1967 by the President and Fellows of Harvard College, all rights reserved. Distributed in Great Britain by Oxford University Press, London. 
Library of Congress catalog card number 67 blah 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 printed in the United States of America. Here on page 20 through 21, 11 early years in the colonies. The development of the Customs Service was merely one particular aspect of the general colonial policy pursued by the restoration government of Charles II. The long years of civil war followed by the Cromwellian protectorate had left the American plantations relatively independent of outside control. With the return of Charles in 1660, that era of freedom was ended and a new period of increased English administrative activity inaugurated. Behind the renewed English interest in the reassertion of royal authority in the colonies lay concern for the prosperity of England. As the principal advisor to Charles II once remarked, upon the king's first arrival in England, he manifested a very great desire to improve the general traffic and trade of the kingdom and upon all occasions conferred with the most active merchants upon it and offered all he could contribute to the advancement thereof. One result of this concern for the promotion of trade was the enactment of the Navigation Acts, which were intended to guide the colonies into a proper commercial relationship with England. However, more than the direction of trade was involved here, the fact of the case was that the principle of mercantilism, as applied to the colonies, presupposed the existence of a high degree of both political and social unity as the conditions of its success. In an effort to achieve that political and social unity, the Restoration Government re-examined every aspect of colonial administration, the establishment of the Dominion of New England being merely the most dramatic result of the new policies. Everywhere, the reintroduction of English authority touched upon areas of colonial sensitivity, and obviously the new customs officers sent to the colonies, innocently or otherwise, hardly could avoid involvement in the tensions created by this explosive situation. In the first decades of the operation of the Colonial Customs Service, three collectors were killed, two imprisoned, and one tried for treason, while another became the chief magistrate in a successful revolutionary government. The record was not encouraging, but the experiences of these first officers, certain lessons were learned, which did much to clarify the nature of the problems facing the English colonial program in America. So, this is similar to what we're living in, where you have corporations running around and um, levying edicts and laws, so-called, based off of foreign interests, foreign investment. You have the same thing going on today as was being done to them at that time. Now, on a different page, 24 to 25. Throughout the rest of the colonial period, the customs officers in that colony were chosen largely from the ranks of the local aristocracy. In this way, the English government sought to gain cooperation in the Old Dominion from the local government. One result of this policy was that the history of the customs service in Virginia thereafter was generally peaceful, and no repetition of the incendiary bland incident. The Virginia story was replayed in the Carolinas with one major variation. In Virginia, the royal collector, Giles Bland, participated in a rebellion against established authority. In the Carolinas, the collector represented the legal governmental authority and was the victim of a revolt against his administration. On November 16, 1676, Thomas Miller was commissioned collector at Albemarle in the Carolinas. He sailed for the colony in company with the newly appointed governor, Thomas Eastchurch. Stopping at Nevis in the West Indies, East Church met a wealthy widow and took hold of the opportunity, married her, and dispatched Mr. Miller for Carolinas. For Carolina. East Church made Miller president of the council until his arrival and gave him very full and ample powers. In this way, the royal collector arrived at Albemarle as a legitimate acting head of government. A peculiar situation had developed in the Carolina settlement, as the land proprietors later pointed out. The illness of the harbors forced the settlers either to send their tobacco overland to Virginia or to depend on merchants from New England, who were the only immediate traders with them. In the circumstances, the New England sea captains exercised a good deal of influence in that part of Carolina. When the news first reached the colony of the appointment of new customs officers, there was a general uproar. The local authorities were warned by some New England merchants and others that it would be a great inconvenience for to submit to this payment and that the New England men did intend to raise their commodities double if such payment were exacted from them. In obedience to instruction, the council appointed Valentine Byrd as acting collector to receive the duties levied by the Act of 1673 until the new collector arrived. 
but so dependent was the community on supplies provided by New Englanders that a compromise was soon arranged whereby the visiting merchants were given refund out of every collection. Miller, who arrived in Albemarle in July 1677, made his first official action in order, in order to the acting collector to account for all receipts he had collected. The rebate to the New Englanders was ended and between July and November 1677, Miller gathered in 1,243 sterling value in old and new receipts from seized goods. Even though this amount was collected in commodities and not in specie, it represented a tremendous imposition on the struggling community. Along with his work as collector, Miller assumed full authority as governor and dealt with the people in a firm manner. He settled a conflict with the Indians in his own words, brought the people who were in a miserable confusion by reason of sundry factions amongst them to a reasonable good from conformity to his majesty's and the lord proprietor's laws and authority. Actually, what Miller had accomplished was to unite the feuding factions in opposition to his government. Previously, not everyone had been allied with the interests of the New England traders, who, although they might furnish needed supplies, also through their monopoly of the market could obtain tobacco at very low rates. Miller managed to alienate both factions, and his fall consequently became a matter of time. In November, Captain Zachariah Gilliam arrived from London with a large cargo of arms and ammunition. According to Gilliam's testimony, he made entry with Miller as required, but the collector, not content merely con to consider his present cargo, asked Gilliam how much tobacco he had carried away on his last voyage. When the captain said nearly 180 hogsheads, the collector insisted on payment of the enumerated duties for that previous load, to which Gilliam replied that he had paid the king his customs in England and did not judge his majesty desired his customs twice. Still, Miller insisted on payment and threatened the captain with arrest should he not comply. Gilliam's arrival was the spark that was needed. The weapons he gave the inhabitants for their defense against the heathen were turned against the collector. Miller was imprisoned for a time on Gilliam's ship and then tried on charges of having expressly expressed treasonable words against the Duke of York and the king. The collection of the customs reverted to normal with the appointment of one of the rebels, John Culpepper, in Miller's place. Now on the next section of this book, 28 through 29. Once again, as in Virginia, the trouble lay in the competing jurisdictions of the royal collectors and the local authorities, particularly the collectors of the casual revenues in the colony. While Roosby was in England, in England, responsibility for the customs operations devol devolved on the surveyor, Nicholas Babcock. Lord Baltimore and the acting collector deferred on the question of whether ships sailing to Ireland should pay the tobacco duty imposed by the Act of 1673. Babcock insisted that they should. Baltimore overruled him and ordered him to clear certain vessels without collecting the duties. The dispute was carried to England where it was settled in Babcock's favor. Lord Baltimore received a severe reprimand and was ordered to pay the sum lost to the revenue through his inf interference. For the moment, Baltimore's concern for the possible threat to his charter led to a period of calm relations. But in 1684, the proprietor left the colony and placed a member of his council, George Talbot, in charge of the government. In October, after drinking heavily, Talbot picked a, quor picked a quarrel with Roosby, who had recently returned to his post and killed him. The fight was preceded by sharp words concerning the conflicting authorities of Talbot and Roosby. Talbot was taken to Virginia, but eventually was released under sentence, commuted to five years banishment. Neither the death of Roosby nor the departure of Talbot ended the struggle in Maryland. The words of the captain of the naval ship stationed in the Chesapeake Bay reporting that no officer of the customs in Maryland can live without a good guard, as it should be, <laughs> were perhaps extreme. But Roosby's successor found that little had changed. In April 1685, the new collector, Nathaniel Blackestone, wrote home that the officials appointed to the colony were interfering with his work. For example, he noted a local agent of the Colonial Council would seize any ship he thought Blackestone might have his eye on. Then that agent, Nicholas Staywell, Lord Baltimore's step stepson, would make an arrangement with the captain, and at a mock trial the ship would be condemned and sold at a token price, the purchaser being the same captain. Against this background, it is understandable that both royal customs collectors in Maryland participated in the rebellion against the proprietor in 1689. 
Blackstone himself was a staunch adherent of the revolutionary leader John Coode. The other collector, John Payne, was killed in an affair involving the same Seawall who had caused Blackstone such difficulty. At the outbreak of Coode's rebellion in 1689, Seawall fled to Virginia. In January 1690, he returned to Maryland in a boat which anchored at the Patuxent Bay River. <clears throat> Payne, hearing of his return, attempted to board the vessel during the night and was killed in the brief battle. Payne, of course, acted as an adherent of Coode's movement, although it is worth noting that he had a legal right to visit any ship entering his waters. Payne's death, coupled with the accession of the Protestant William III and Mary, enabled the revolutionary movement to climax its efforts with success. An assembly was called the royal collector Blackstone being elected president, an appeal was made to the new monarchs to make Maryland a royal province. In 1691, the government of the colony was taken into royal control, although the property rights still were left to the proprietor, so that in this colony, for the moment at least, the royal collector emerged victorious. In Massachusetts, the situation of the customs officers in these early years combined to the, the worst features of the problems facing their colleagues in Virginia, Carolina, and Maryland. The charter government of the Bay Colony claimed a privileged status, much like that of the proprietary regimes in Maryland and Carolina. While the long-established Puritan hierarchy and its monopoly of power bore resemblances to the entrenched administration of Governor Berkeley in Virginia, as a result, the settlement of the Customs Service in Massachusetts was a long and bitter struggle. After the Stuart Restoration, steps were taken to recall Massachusetts, which had assumed the powers and position of an independent commonwealth, to its proper dependence on England. In 1664, a commission was appointed to visit the various colonies. It is suggestive that this commission was provided with two sets of instructions, one relating to Massachusetts and the other to all remaining plantations. From the beginning, the Bay Colony was considered quite correctly as a special problem. Now, on page 86 and 87, Birch Field's greatest difficulties arose from yet another case involving certain bonds. On this occasion, the bonds had been taken to ensure payment of duties and forfeited to the crown. Several gentlemen were responsible for payment on the bond, but instead of offering a cash settlement, they signed over to the king certain debts owed to them by others. The receiver general of the province held these obligations in trust for the crown. When Birchfield determined to collect these debts and put bills in action against the names he was given, he encountered a major problem. He discovered that he had no way of knowing how much each individual was responsible for, nor could he find any proof whatsoever that the indicated party parties actually owed the original offenders anything at all. In line with the usual colonial practice of obstruction, during Birchfield's investigations, the Assembly of Maryland passed an act declaring that no legal actions pending in county courts should continue longer than 12 months. In a provincial or high court of appeals for more than 19, or in any court of chancery, more than 25. As if this act were not pointed open enough at Birchfield, in the same session, the Assembly passed another piece of legislation disabling Thomas McNamara, who was acting as counsel for the King, from performing his duties. McNamara, in order to procure some relief against said act, came to England. The act was repealed and soon after died. In general, Birchfield met with so many difficulties and obstacles in his prosecution of these suits, both from the parties and the gentlemen of the country, that many of them could not be brought to a conclusion or a hearing. He failed to finish all the cases within the time permitted by the act, and by color thereof, some of the suits had been, have been dismissed with costs. The judges there imagining that the king and his interests, though not mentioned, is bound by these acts. As a final harassment of the deputy secretary of the province later brought suit against the surveyor general himself for fees he claimed were due to him for filling bills, returning writs, and so forth. During the above prosecutions, so on, one Sunday Birchfield found himself arrested as his majesty's debtor and ordered to pay the fees. It was of little comfort to him that eventually one legal authority in London, on hearing that the Lord Proprietor was exempted from such fees, tentatively expressed the thought that the Crown ought to have equal privilege and exemption with the Lord Proprietor, or prior proprietary. In attempting to strengthen straighten out past administrative irregularities and ensure future compliance with the acts of trade, Birchfield encountered one of the basic truths of the custom officer's situation. Obstruction, not cooperation, was usually to be expected from local colonial authorities.
while in particular provincial courts and legal apparatus would be employed to the full to delay and frustrate the enforcement of undesirable regulations. There were, of course, the admiralty courts, and the question naturally arose as to whether those courts could be used for such prosecutions against forfeited bonds, thus avoiding the interference of the local judges, juries, and officials. However, Attorney General Sir Edward Northey in England put an end to such hopes when he declared that suits involving plantation bonds could not be heard in admiralty court until and unless it should be expressly so authorized by Act of Parliament. Another official having his difficulties with the local courts was Nathaniel Kay, a collector in Rhode Island. Kay happening upon five hogsheads of claret, which had been smuggled ashore and concealed in a back house, left the wine in the custody of the sheriff and a guard while he searched for a cart to move the barrels. Before he returned, the owner came along with a number of people in a riotous manner and destroyed the hogsheads. As being armed with axes, they threatened to kill the officers in case they resisted. The collector knew better than to attempt to obtain redress in the provincial courts, which he had good reason to know were used by the trading people of the island in arresting the customs staff for taking their just fees and put them under very great difficulties and take them in execution for their duties by the laws made there, which never had the king's sanction. But the collector wondered, what about the possibility of removing such cases to England to be tried in Westminster Hall? The answer this time was yes, the trials could be heard in Westminster as permitted in Section 7 of the Act of 1696. Unfortunately, at the same time that this possibility was pronounced legally acceptable, it was recognized as unworkable in practice, because the difficulty of transmitting not only evidence, but the defendants themselves over the ocean. On page 192 and 193, the most publicized outbreak took place in Massachusetts in May 1764. John Robinson became collector of the customs in Rhode Island. From the beginning, his experiences were unfortunate. The governor had refused to swear him into office, and within a short time of his arrival, a vessel seized on the order of the surveyor general was rescued by a mob of disguised citizens. In April of the next year, a ship named Polly entered at Newport from Suriname. Her cargo was entered at the customs house, and the vessel proceeded elsewhere to unload her molasses. Robinson, meanwhile, became suspicious of the small size of of the entered cargo and determined that the poly should be thoroughly examined. He overtook the ship at Dyden on, in Massachusetts on the 6th of April, 1765. Four days after the original entry had been made, on board he found nearly double the reported amount of molasses. Robinson, of course, seized the poly, but could not find enough men at Dyton to sail her back to Newport for trial. Leaving two of his men in charge of the ship, the collector returned to Rhode Island to find a crew. In his absence, a mob boarded the ship, stripped her of her cargo and all her furnishings, allowing the poly to run ashore. Robinson hurried back to Dighton with a large party of armed marines and sailors, only to find that a warrant had been issued for his arrest on a charge brought against him by the captain of the poly. Eager to give the colonists no cause to complain and they, he ignored the law, the collector submitted to arrest and was taken to Totten, where he was jailed. To this point, the story of the poly was a simple and fla flagrant example of colonial opposition to the work of the customs officers. But the aftermath of the rescue of the seized cargo exposed one of the fundamental weaknesses in the customs service. Both the place where the seizure had been made and the town where Robinson was imprisoned were within the jurisdiction of Massachusetts. The governor of that colony and the surveyor general had long been at odds. Both were ambitious men, and the new emphasis on strict enforcement of the acts of trade gave the surveyor general an importance which rivaled that of the governor. Both were involved in enforcing the acts, but the limits of their responsibilities had never been defined. Anxious to exert his new authority, Surveyor General Temple claimed the sole right to see to the observance of the trade laws. In his view, the governor was merely a local civil official, when required to bring to the support of the government to the aid of the customs officers. Unless requested to do so, Temple thought the governor had no authority over the customs service in any manner at all. Governor Bernard, in turn, felt that anything affecting his administration was his concern and the conduct of the customs officers was immediately within the power of review. When Temple had first arrived in Massachusetts, the struggle between Benjamin Barons and the merchants on one side and the other customs officers and the governor on the other had been at its height. Resenting the interference of Bernard in the affair, Temple had given certain documents to Barons indirectly helping him in the contest. In Bernard's words, the severe general had discovered an haughty jealousy of me and my office. For a time after the departure of Barons, there was a truce between the two rivals, rival officials. 
But when the Sugar Act was passed, a new regulation sent out to secure the strict observance of all the acts, the feud flared anew. Partly the contest involved the power of patronage. By binding all the customs officer to himself alone, Temple thought to build the Surveyor General's patronage into an office of overriding central importance. Bernard sought to combine patronage within the customs service with other openings available to him in order to increase the prestige of and support for the royal government in Massachusetts. The first casualty in the struggle between the governor and the Surveyor General was the collector in Salem, James Cokel, who was numbered among the friends of the governor and so incurred the wrath of Temple. In March 1764, Cokel discovered that a large amount of molasses had been imported into Salem on forged certificates. He went to the governor and consulted with him on what, he should, be, what should be done. Bernard advised that the molasses should be prosecuted in proof of the fraud obtained from the governor of Antigua, where the cargo had been taken on board. With that decision made, Cokel informed Temple of the affair. The surveyor general saw his opportunity, censored the collector for attempting to prosecute the goods instead of collecting the duties he felt should be paid, and suspended Cokel from office. Now on page 228 and 229. Although the colonial opposition at first held its hand, it did not take the members of the board long to understand the exact nature of their situation. In one of their early letters, they reported to the Treasury that already it was apparent that the Customs Service in America suffered from a lack of support from civil authorities. During the last two and one and a half years, they noted there had been only six seizures in all New England, only one of which was prosecuted to effect. Somewhat for forlornly, they remarked that the earlier customs officials had been resisted and defeated in almost every attempt to do their duty when the right of Parliament to lay external taxes was acknowledged. Now that the right of Parliament to lay any taxes whatsoever had been questioned, we expect that we shall find it totally impractical to enforce the execution of the revenue laws until the hand of government is properly strengthened. Nor did the Governor Bernard have any illusions on that subject. When asked by the commissioners for assistance, he replied that he had none to give. As royal governor in a, popular, in a popularly dominated colony, he was powerless. His authority, Bernard reported, would have to be strengthened before he could do much in support of the board. Both Bernard and the commissioners correctly assessed the critical issue of the moment. Quite simply, they were involved in a race against time to bolster the support available to royal government in America before a final trial of strength was forced upon them. In March 1768, open opposition to the board first appeared, as reported by Bernard, Daniel Malcolm, a little trader who had made a reputation for himself earlier by his resistance to the customs officers, expecting the arrival of a vessel from the Madeiras, approached the customs officers and asked what indulgence he might expect in regard to his duties, or to the duties. Told none at all, Malcolm replied that he was pleased to know exactly how matters stood. When the ship arrived, he had it anchor below the town and loaded a reported total of 60 pipes of wine which were then smuggled into Boston and hidden in various cellars. The next day, Malcolm's captain went to the customs house and entered as having to come in ballast from Suriname. Since no one could be found to inform on Malcolm, he suffered not at all. In fact, three days after a successful coup, Malcolm presided over a general meeting of the merchants of Boston, called to discuss opposition to the new British measures. As Bernard pointed out, this meeting was, in a sense, the first extra-legal assembly to be called in Boston in protest against the Acts of Parliament, previous discussions having been carried on in the regular town meetings. The irritating Malcolm affair was merely a foretaste of things to come. From the moment of the appointment of the American board, the Colonial Customs Service as a whole centered on its operations, a fact that was obvious both to the commissioners and the opposition groups in Massachusetts. Consequently, consequently, more than local antagonisms were involved in the campaign of harassment undertaken against the board and its members. It was obvious by March 1768 that Sam Adams and the other leaders of the faction were waiting for the right moment to display their strength. A continuance of the truce had been in effect since the arrival of the commissioners could have been maintained only by deliberate refusal on the part of the members of the board to exercise their authority. Since the commissioners could not procrastinate forever, the moment the incident the opposition was looking for inevitably would arrive. Fittingly, it was John Hancock, one of the wealthiest and most influential of Boston's merchants, a man who had earlier stated publicly at a meeting of the General Assembly that no customs officer would be permitted on board his ships, who ignited the spark that drove the commissioners from the city. On April 7, 1768, one of Hancock's ships, the Lydia, arrived in Boston. Two tidesmen were put on board by the collector, 
While they were there, Hancock and a crowd of followers, including Malcolm, boarded the ship. According to the laws, customs officers were permitted to board a vessel either to search for illegal goods or to see that no goods were unloaded without the knowledge of the authorities. In the former case, they were free to inspect the entire ship, but if their orders were merely to watch for the attempts to smuggle goods ashore, the law specified only that they might remain on board. Hancock ordered his captain not to let the Tiesman below deck on pain of dismissal. However, the following night, one of the officers, thinking he was unobserved, went below to look the cargo over. Hancock was summoned and confronted the Tiesman, surrounded by eight or so followers, including once again the ever-present Malcolm. 2.30 and 2.31. By the show of force, the Tiesman stated that he had no orders to search the boat. Thereupon, thereupon Hancock had him forcibly carried on deck while the companionway was fastened shut behind him. Malcolm, the meanwhile, shouted, Damn him, hang him up. If he was my vessel, I would knock him down. Again, as an earlier incident involving Malcolm Seller, this minor affair was blown up into a major incident. In the tense expectant atmosphere of Boston in that year, very little was required to ignite an explosion. The commissioners wished to make an example of this affair, fearing that if such flagrant intimidation of the outdoor officers was allowed to pass, no tidesman would be able to, in the future, to perform his duties. However, once again, the technicalities of the laws defeated their intentions. The tidesman had said that he had no orders to inspect the cargo. Consequently, he legally had no right below deck, so that there was no case against Hancock. And the fact that the officer made such a statement surrounded by a crowd of unfriendly men in the dark hold of the ship made no difference. The matter had to be dropped. While the case of the Lydia was being discussed, another of Hancock's ships, the Liberty, arrived in Boston, coming from the Madeiras with a cargo of wine. The captain entered 25 pipes of wine at the customs house. It was reported that much more, <clears throat> much more wine was actually on board, but the two tidesmen stationed on the Liberty, Liberty stated that nothing more than the reported cargo was discharged from the vessel. However, the commissioners, remembering that Hancock had given out in public that we, the commissioners, are not recalled, he will get rid of us before Christmas, were not convinced that all was well with liberty. The outdoor officers were one of the weak links in the operation of the Customs Service. The most exposed to danger, they were also the most open to bribery. In fact, there were, if, were few, if any, checks on their activities except that they usually worked in pairs. Generally, it was reported that either intimidation or bribery was frequently effective in inducing them to ignore their duty. Only two months before the arrival of the Liberty, the commissioners themselves had informed the Treasury that they had discovered that the local outdoor officers were guilty of collusive practices. As a corrective, the commissioners had appointed more tidesmen, but all that had been accomplished was to further irritate the merchants. Similarly, a few years later, the collector of Philadelphia reported with disgust that of the ten tidesmen in his port, two were under suspension and three others under suspicion of complicity in various illegal entries. Now in the case of Liberty, a strange tale unfolded. A month after the arrival and unloading of the Liberty, one of the tidesmen, Thomas Kirk, went to the collector and comptroller and told them the following story. On the night the Liberty had docked in Boston, he and his fellow tidesmen had been put on board. The three, the other officers soon had much to drink and staggered off home. One of Hancock's captains later came on board and suggested to Kirk that he should permit the wine to be unloaded. According to Kirk, he refused that suggestion and was thereupon forced below deck and locked there for three hours. During that period, he heard men at work moving the cargo about and possibly unloading some. When he was finally released, Hancock's captain threatened that if one word of the affair is reported to the authorities, Kirk's property and indeed his life would be endangered. Kirk kept his silence for a month, but during that period, the captain who had threatened him died. The tidesman then felt free to carry his story to his superiors, or so he reported. The truth behind the story told by Kirk will never be known. It is possible that he was lying either at the request of the collector and comptroller who wished to revenge themselves on Hancock or for reasons of his own. Perhaps Kirk had permitted the wine to be unloaded, except bribe for doing so, and then after the captain had died thought he could make more by informing to his superiors. Or perhaps Kirk was telling the simple truth. Hancock had previously shown that he knew how to use intimidation effectively, and Kirk may have really been frightened into silence. William Baxter, who has made an exhaustive study of Hancock's papers, reported that he could find nothing to either prove or disprove Hancock's statement that there were only 25 pipes of wine on board the Liberty. 
Considering Hancock's earlier public defiance of the customs officers as well as the activities of Malcolm, the collector had good reason to suspect that Kirk's story was true. At any rate, it seemed a good opportunity to make an example of the infatuated merchant. 232 to 233. American board seized the liberty. In the process, they unleashed a storm of angry opposition far beyond anything the commissioners had expected. By their hasty action, the controller, collector, and comptroller precipitated a crisis which left the commissioners in a difficult situation. The case against Hancock and the illegal unloading of the wine was not, to say the least, particularly strong. It depended on the testimony of one man given long after the fact. Although both their unsolicitor and the Attorney General of England thought there was enough evidence to take the case to trial, the commissioners wisely decided not to let the trial stand on the matter of the wines and Kirk's testimony. When the Liberty had been seized on June 10th, it was discovered that a new cargo already had been put on board. No permit to load had been taken out by Hancock. It had been customary in the past, in spite of the letter of the law, for ships to take on cargo before clearing at the customs house. Still, the legal requirement was that no vessel should take on any goods until a permit had been obtained. On that point, the customs officers had a good cause against Hancock. The ship itself was tried and condemned on the grounds of loading but before permission had been given. Success in that test was tempered for the commissioners by the humiliation of a flight from Boston. When the customs officers had seized the liberty on June 10th, a crowd had gathered and they had been abused, hit by stones and threatened with reprisals. Much of the crowd's anger was caused by the determination of the officers to anchor their prize under the guns of the royal man of war then in the harbor. They feared that leaving the liberty at the wharf would be an open invitation for the faction to attempt a forcible seizure or rescue. With help of Marines from the man of war, they managed to take the liberty to a safe anchorage. The Royal Marines were abused equally with the customs officer during the whole operation. The following uproar was so great that the commissioners themselves had to flee to the safety of the same man of war which guarded the liberty. Disturbed at the violence of the outburst, the commissioners thought to pacify the town by returning the ship to the wharf and to the possession of Hancock. They opened negotiations with Hancock to that effect, asking that in return he would promise to abide by the decision of the Admiralty Court when the case came to trial. At first it seemed that this plan would be successful. Hancock was anxious to get his vessel back and may even have initiated the compromise idea himself. But while he was debating whether or not to accept the offer of the commissioners, all the leaders of the faction called upon him and urged him not to give up this opportunity to win a propaganda advantage over the English. Hancock finally refused the overtures of the commissioners, who consequently failed in their hopes of restoring quiet to the town. They finally sought refuge in the fort in Boston Harbor, which was offered to them by Governor Bernard. The commissioners at this point had been in Boston less than eight months. Many years before, William Bolin had suggested that the trade laws would never be enforced adequately until the customs officer were authorized to prosecute the people involved in violations of the acts, as well as the ships or goods in question. This proposal had been revived in the discussion that had taken place in 1759. Now, the Attorney General of England reported that it might well to bring suits against the men involving, involved in unloading the goods from the Liberty, as well as against those obstructing the seizure. Feeling that in spite of their attempts to prevent the affair from playing into the hands of the faction, the case of Liberty, Liberty had become an open trial of strength. The commissioners decided to initiation, initiate a personal action against Hancock and some of his associates. The trial of Hancock and five alleged accomplices was commenced in October 1768. The Crown lawyers asked judgment against each man for 9,000 uh, sterling pounds sterling. Treble, the estimated value of the wine supposedly smuggled ashore. Hancock was defended by a young lawyer, John Adams. Much of Adams' argument was based on constitutional theory. In fact, the Crown's case was extremely weak. It depended mainly on Kirk's belated testimony coupled with public statements and actions of Hancock prior to the arrival of Liberty in Boston. The hearings dragged on through the winter until March. The decision was made to drop the case against Hancock and his associates with the words, our sovereign lord the king will prosecute no further. The commissioners admitted defeat. On this occasion, more harm was done than merely exposing, once again, the weakness of royal authority in America. Hancock became a hero for thousands of colonists. The arguments of Adams were echoed from one colony to the next. Of equal importance was the fact that English troops were sent to Boston. 234 to 235. From their, from their retreat in the harbor fort, 
<clears throat> the commissioners reported that they could not return to Boston until measures were taken for their support. Governor Bernard hesitated to call for troops in his own name, fearing that if he did so, anger, the anger his actions would arouse would ruin any further aid he might be able to render to the royal cause in Massachusetts. General Thomas Gage in New York was willing, indeed eager, to send soldiers to Boston to assert English authority, but could not act without either a request from Bernard or orders from London. Finally, the English ministry decided the time for firmness had arrived and dispatched four regiments to Boston. The Sons of Liberty threatened to oppose the landing of the troops with force, but the colonists were not yet ready for such extreme measures. The troops landed in September 1768 and remained there until the fateful day of the Boston Massacre a year and a half later. Indirectly, Hancock and his ship, the Liberty, had commenced a series of events leading to open revolution. Although the affair of the Liberty took an added importance because it involved the commissioners of the customs themselves and led to their flight from Boston, an equally famous and disastrous seizure was made at the time in Charleston, South Carolina. The feud there between the customs officers and Henry Laurent had lost none of its bitterness, or Lawrence, in the months following the trials of the Wamba and the Broughton Island Packet. George Rupel, left to, the hand, left to handle the case by the collector who fled to province, was sued by Lawrence, Lawrence for 5,000 pounds in damages. In releasing the Broughton Island Packet, Judge Lay had failed to decree a probable cause of seizure, leaving Rupel open to such a suit. Although the judge himself acted as Rupel's lawyer in the common law trial, Lawrence won a verdict of 1,400 pounds local currency against the customs officer. That sum was eventually paid for Rupel by the customs commissioners, but the officer was determined on revenge. Rupel's opportunity came when one of Lawrence's ships, the Anne, took on cargo in Charleston. Although the main cargo, rice, had been entered properly at the customs house, the captain had neglected to report various other small items taken on board. According to the Act of 1766, all goods enumerated or non-enumerated had to be declared. Rupel took advantage of the captain's omission and seized the Anne. At first he hoped to use his prize to force Lawrence to admit his guilt in the earlier case of the Broughton Island packet, which would in fact reverse the decision against Rupel in the common lawsuit. Lawrence declined to accept the scheme and Rupel was forced to take the Anne to trial. Once again, Judge Lay presided over the hearings. His decision in this case was in line with his earlier rulings. rulings. He acquitted the Anne, but declared a probable cause of seizure and assessed the cost of the trial to Lawrence. Actually, there was literal else Judge Lay could have done. Although it had never been customary previously to enforce the Act of 1766, so strictly the captain of the Anne had broken the letter of the law. On the other hand, it seemed unfair to condemn Lawrence's ship on a technicality not previously insisted on by the customs officers. Despite the difficulty of the judge's decision, Lawrence was infuriated at the verdict and broke off all relations with his uncle. As a result of this trial, Lawrence opened a propaganda warfare against the whole Customs Service and Judge Lay in particular. In February 1768, he published extracts from the hearings to illustrate the arbitrary nature of Admiralty Court justice. Lay answered with a pamphlet entitled The Man Unmasked, to which Lawrence in turn responded with a further publication of Observations, on the conduct of the customs officers and the admiralty courts. The publicity given to this affair seemed to crystallize public opinion and to furnish such propagandists as Sam Adams with effective arguments for a united front against the incursions of imperial authority. By the autumn of 1768, it was obvious that the experiment undertaken in the establishment of the American board was a failure. Centralization of the customs service had served merely to give focus to the colonial opposition. The commissioners came to symbolize the existence of an arbitrary external authority, and every successful attack on the board or its members took on the aspect of a major colonial victory. Rather belatedly, the Treasury realized at this point and cautioned the commissioners to remember the delicate nature of their situation. From the point of view of the commissioners, driven into hiding a mere eight months after their arrival, such advice must have seemed gratuitous. In July 1768, the Treasury Lords advised the members of the board to act with firmness and resolution in executing the laws, but at the same time to conduct themselves with such temper and discretion as may give no just grounds of complaint. Now, 236 through 237. The commissioners and the other officers in America knew only too well how impossible it was to act with firmness and still give the colonists no cause for complaint. 
In Salem, Massachusetts, for example, a month before the Treasury wrote those words, a boat belonging to the Customs House was seized by various local people, carried to an area beyond the reach of rescue, and burned. A month after the commissioners received the reprimand from the Treasury, one of the tidesmen in Salem was tarred and feathered, carried about the town, tied to the Liberty Pole, and wore never to show his face there again. Only five days later, the customs officers guarding a seizure at Cape Ann, north of Salem, were forcibly locked inside a warehouse by a reported crowd of 17 or more men while the goods were carried off. In these circumstances, the decision for the customs officers was not how to act with caution, but whether or not to act at all. Unfortunately, the efficiency of the American board was further reduced by a feud among its own members. Charles Paxton and John Temple were old enemies. The ill feeling between them dated back to the episode of Benjamin Barron's nearly a decade earlier. Paxton had the majority of the board on his side, and Temple's official isolation was furthered by the fact that he and Governor Bernard had long been at odds. Partly the dispute centered on personalities, both Temple and Bernard, as well as Paxton, were ambitious men jealous of their prerogatives and powers. But involved in this feud was also a fundamental disagreement on the nature of the imperial system and the proper role to be played by the royal officials in America. Paxton and Bernard stood for firmness and a determined effort to assert English authority. Temple believed that in practice, the officials should do all they could to mitigate the severities of the laws of Parliament. In Temple's opinion, the commercial welfare of the colonists was hurt by the unnecessary severities occasioned by our instructions. And he reported sympathetically that since 1768, trade in America had been greatly reduced and what remains has in great measure deserted its usual channel. While Bernard or Paxton might argue that the longer English authority was not exercised, the greater degree of contempt for that authority evidenced in America, Temple argued that such views set them to flow rather from an anxious desire of lighting up a war between these colonies and their mother country, who preferred to act upon principle and to endeavor to regulate and settle revenue matters upon an equal, moderate, and practical system. While Temple's practical approach had much to recommend it, still in terms of the immediate situation, his attitude made him a highly unsuitable person for membership on the American board. His policy of catering the needs and demands of the colonists was in direct opposition to the policies and instructions of the other members of the board, and Temple's activities did inestimable harm to the effectiveness of the commissioners. Thomas Hutchison explained the internal troubles of the board in this way. The popular clamor against four of the commissioners and not the fifth is easily accounted for. It was said that the commissioners could cause new changes and new and heavy burdens upon trade. The people wished, therefore, that the Surveyor General might not be superseded. The commissioners exerted themselves to restore the acts of trade, which for two or three years together no officer dared to carry into execution. Penal laws, which have been disused from opposition made by the people, are considered as more grievous when revived than when first enacted. The people, therefore, have always wished to see the board abolished and the Surveyor General restored. Temple was not bothered by the harassment his colleagues experienced. While they took shelter in the harbor fort, he continued to live in Boston and come and go as he pleased. This was true both in 1768 after the seizure of Liberty and again in 1777, when the commissioners once more retreated to Boston in the aftermath of the massacre. Temple continued to complain that he was not permitted to see any documents, that the others never consulted him on any important matters, and that generally he was ignored. In turn, the other commissioners felt Temple was not to be trusted with any information, as he was quite likely to pass anything he learned on to his colonial friends. The reluctance of the commissioners on this point echoed by Thomas Hutchinson. When Hutchinson had some confidential news for the members of the board, he stipulated that it be kept from the knowledge of the fifth. 246 to 247. But in revenge, he was prosecuted on charge of having wounded one of the sailors in the boat he seized and required to spend some time in the local jail, while his quarry escaped and carried the boat and its cargo off to Philadelphia. Still determined, Hatton had sent his son to Philadelphia to warn the collector there to watch for the arrival of the rescued boat. Inspecting the harbor, his son found the boat already arrived. Realizing that they were discovered, the crew of the boat organized an attack on young Hatton who was dragged from place to place, beaten savagely, tarred and feathered, and even had hot tar poured into open wounds he had previously received in helping to make the original seizure. In the words of the Philadelphia collector, young Hatton was tortured in a manner above related an hour or more. In the manner above related an hour or more. During that time, no public official came to his aid, nor any private person for that matter. As a result of this ordeal, young Hatton lay for a time near death, and when he didn't did recover, he had lost the use of his right arm. From this whole affair, Hatton received little satisfaction. 
The authorities in New Jersey disclaimed any responsibility since the seizure had been made in the Bay and not within their jurisdiction. At the same time, however, Hatton was prosecuted by the common law courts for attacking and wounding a sailor during the affray. Seemingly, if New Jersey had authority over that charge, they had equal jurisdiction in the matter of the rescued seizure, but of course, they simply did not wish to act. As to the barbaric treatment accorded to his son in Philadelphia, no one could be found to testify against the guilty parties and the case was dropped after a brief investigation. As commentary on the Hatton incident, the collector of Philadelphia offered these words. In short, the truth of the matter is the hands of the government are not strong enough to oppose the numerous body of people who wish well to the cause of smuggling. What can a governor do without the assistance of the governed? When can the magistrates, what can the magistrates do unless they are supported by their fellow citizens? What can the king's officers do if they make themselves obnoxious to the people amongst whom they reside? Other incidents, too, were allowed to pass with little notice. In Boston, the Comptroller General of the American Board was molested in his way home one night, while one of the Tidesmans was attacked by disorderly men and boys and Negroes also, who tarred and feathered him and carried him about the town. His ordeal lasted over four hours. The relaxed policy which permitted these deeds to go unpunished had its dangerous aspect. When in 1772 the people of Rhode Island attacked and destroyed the Royal Customs Cutter stationed in the waters, Thomas Hutchison wrote to London that if England shows no resentment against that colony for so high an affront, they may venture upon any further measures which are necessary to obtain and secure their independence. He added that if the offenders in the Gatsby affair were not punished, the friends to the gut the friends to government will despond and give up all hopes of being able to withstand the faction. Although aroused to appoint a commission to investigate the destruction of the Gatsby, the Ministry of Lord North only half-heartedly supported the inquiry and dropped the case when the commissioners reported that they were unable to assign the guilt to any particular citizen in the chaotically democratic colony of Rhode Island. The only result of the Gatsby investigation was the addition of several hundred pounds to the sums paid out by the cashier of the Customs Service from the American Revenues. During this period, although unable to protect their officers, the American Board Commissioners did at least achieve harmony in their own ranks. John Temple was recalled to England in 1777 and replaced by Benjamin Hallowell, the former Comptroller of Boston, who had been in England reporting on the riots created by the seizure of the Liberty. With the departure of Temple, the Commissioners worked in close cooperation and did their best to perform their duties with the required caution. When urged to start prosecutions against various bonds which had not been canceled as required, the commissioners advised the Treasury that finding that it had not been usual to enforce the laws in this particular, they felt doing so now would only serve to increase the general opposition to the revenue laws. In reply, the Treasury said that they would leave the decision to the commissioners with the hope that they would put such bonds in suit as it could be done without trouble. Thank you. If you had enjoyed this video, please check out my other content. Uh, my other channels, uh, my Substack. Also, there are free books available at the links, and if you so desire, you may support my work at any of the options available Venmo, PayPal, Cash App, Buy Me Coffee.